the John W. Whitaker Intermodal Terminal. The sheer size of the terminal is impressive alone. However, the creation of this massive facility is just as impressive. We'll examine how 830 acres of land was turned into a state-of-the-art transportation facility as we travel down the road to Austell. This is in Yard, Norfolk Southern's existing intermodal facility located in Atlanta. As the city grew over the past 20 years, Inman Yard was virtually blocked in on all sides with no room to expand. The intermodal business continued to grow and trailer parking was soon replaced with additional unloading tracks. Remote trailer parking lots were leased to support the intermodal operation at the yard. This was expensive and inefficient. The Inman Intermodal was operating at a capacity of 420,000 crane lifts per year, more than any other Norfolk Southern intermodal facility of its size. We were growing over at Inman, but quite frankly, it was uh, unsustainable and untenable growth. As we grew over there, our product quality deteriorated at an increasing level as we had to use off-site lots to park equipment, as we had to stage and stack trains coming into the facility. In 1993, Norfolk Southern purchased 830 acres, 14 miles west of the Inman facility, in a small city named Austell. In the beginning, Local and county government officials welcomed the proposed development. But when Norfolk Southern postponed the project until business levels justified the expenditure that would be needed to construct a facility large enough, the political winds changed direction. Local opposition grew, and the governing bodies chose to try to block the construction of the facility. Originally, the entire site was not zoned for the intended use. Norfolk Southern requested a zoning change. At the same time, some Austell citizens that opposed the project persuaded a local hardware store owner, who was also a longtime state legislator, to speak for them at the public zoning meeting in 1996. The man was able to convince council members that a freight terminal in the area would have a negative impact on the community. The zoning change was denied. It seemed as though only an act of Congress could move the project forward. Well, there was an act of Congress. The Interstate Commerce Commission Termination Act held that uh, local zoning and state regulation needed to be preempted when it interfered with interstate commerce. The Interstate Commerce Termination Act, or ICCTA, was passed in 1996 and the Surface Transportation Board was created. This included a provision that preempted state and local government regulation of construction and operation of certain rail facilities. Uh, you had a local government that initially was supportive, then hostile, then supportive. You had county governments uh, in the surrounding area that took different positions. And the, the moving through that system uh, illustrates clearly that federal preemption of this kind of development authority is needed to allow facilities to be cited. Norfolk Southern took the zoning denial to federal court and obtained a court order in August of 1997 holding that the ICCTA law preempts, among other things, local zoning ordinances that preclude rail facilities. After the court decision, the city realized the facility could be built without local zoning and the cost to appeal would be very high. The city rethought its decision and reached a settlement with Norfolk Southern as to some of the design characteristics of the development. Norfolk Southern also agreed to help the community in more ways, such as a land donation for recreational purposes and other considerations. As a result of this agreement, the city dropped its opposition to the project, issued the necessary city permits, and cooperated in closing some city streets that were within the site. The city was on board, but there was still opposition from the surrounding county, who filed a lawsuit against Norfolk Southern, claiming that the construction of the project would be a nuisance. Oh, and that hardware store owner that spoke against Norfolk Southern at the original zoning meeting was elected governor of Georgia. Back on the home front, conflict arose regarding a five-lane state road that made an S-curve through the middle of the site. In order for Norfolk Southern to proceed with construction, this road needed to be relocated. Through a special tax referendum in 1994, the county collected tax dollars to fund the relocation, but plans were put on the back burner by the county and the state during the zoning process. Norfolk Southern developed plans to relocate the one-mile road to the south end of the property. 
The state DOT agreed to allow Norfolk Southern to build the road for them. They also agreed to a land swap that would give Norfolk Southern the existing road right-of-way in return for the same area of land that surrounded the new road when it was completed. As a result of the agreement, the local county filed suit against the DOT, claiming that the land under the existing road would belong to the county once the existing road was removed. In July of 1997, the application for a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers permit was prepared and submitted. Norfolk Southern was proposing to disturb 450 acres of the 830-acre site, pave 270 acres, and impact 26 acres of wetlands. Adjacent to the site was an historic district that consisted of an old thread mill and neighborhood community called Clarkdale Historic District that was listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Norfolk Southern worked through the permit requirements and wetland mitigation plan that included the creation of three wetlands on the site that totaled 35 acres. In January of 1999, Norfolk Southern was issued a conditioned permit. One of the conditions was an historic review process. As a result of this, Norfolk Southern enhanced buffers between the facility and residential area, reconfigured the lighting, and made additional noise monitoring commitments. Another condition required a water quality permit from the State Department of Natural Resources. This permit was opposed by a small city downstream from the project, claiming its water supply would be adversely impacted by stormwater runoff from the site. To satisfy the permit requirements, Norfolk Southern designed 29 acres of detention ponds that included a provision for spill containment and water treatment. Norfolk Southern also agreed to set up monitoring stations in the two adjacent waterways to test the quality of the water once the facility went into operation. The county continued to oppose the project and brought suit against the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Norfolk Southern. The county challenged the granting of the permit on the grounds that the historic review was not handled properly. While all this litigation was going on, development of the plans proceeded. The purpose was to design a facility that would be built in two phases and have a capacity of 600,000 crane lifts per year. For an intermodal operation, a working surface is needed, similar to a tabletop, with tracks running through it to facilitate cranes loading and unloading containers and trailers. The tabletop also provides space to park trailers in between destinations. The tabletop is one mile long, a quarter mile wide, and incorporates six separate mile-long working tracks. The tracks that lead to each end of this tabletop have to be on a gentle slope to facilitate heavy rail cars traveling at low speeds. These factors set the elevation of the facility, and the earth above that point had to be moved. A small 12-track rail yard was designed beside the intermodal working area to supply the intermodal working tracks. Switching leads were also designed beside the main track so trains could be prepared to leave the yard without interfering with traffic on the main line. The facility includes four separate buildings, a three-story administration building that functions as a gate check-in for trucks, an observation area for the yard, and office space for management and staff. Two small buildings provide mechanical and transportation functions, and a large shop building and maintenance pad. The pad provides a place for large cranes to be maintained and an area where industrial fluids can be collected and treated. Since the facility would require so much pavement where there had once been soil, six ponds were designed that totaled 29 acres. These ponds catch rainwater that runs off the pavement at a rapid rate and releases it slowly to prevent flooding nearby creeks. The most important feature of the facility design was room to grow and expand. There is a vision for the future. Uh, we've already laid the steps for uh, future growth. Also, the facility is going to allow us to continue to grow and increase our market share in the southeast. In January of 1999, Norfolk Southern was completing the design and making construction plans. The first phase of construction included a 170-acre paved intermodal working area, four miles of unloading tracks, five miles of yard tracks, five miles of switching leads, parking for 3,233 trailers, crane ways for rubber tire cranes with 47-foot, 6-inch wheel spans, four buildings that total 18,000 square feet. The second phase of the facility was designed and permitted, but won't be built until traffic levels warrant expansion. Construction began in October 1999, 
as soon as the historic review condition of the core permit was complete. The site was cleared, sedimentation ponds were dug, and erosion control devices were put in place to protect two creeks and a large wetland adjacent to the construction. The first objective was to construct the earth berms around the project to shield the adjacent community from noise and the view of the development. There were several significant factors in the critical path of the construction timetable. First was the quantity of excavation. There was six and one half million cubic yards of dirt to be moved. Only one and a half million was needed to build the facility. The remaining dirt was stockpiled in an area designated for phase two expansion. This stockpile of dirt is 45 feet tall and covers about 75 acres. During the bulk excavation, 35,000 cubic yards per day were moved during two 10-hour shifts. Drains were installed deep in the ground close to the elevation of finished grade. The 3,000-foot longitudinal drain worked with a system of vertical pipes and pumps to lower the groundwater as excavation progressed to an elevation 20 feet below the existing groundwater in some areas. The second significant factor was the construction of a railroad bridge. One of the facility's switching leads, which parallels the main track, required a bridge to cross Sweetwater Creek. The existing main track bridge was a through-girder design that allows the track to run between the steel beams that hold up the bridge span. This was done so the structure would be above the high water elevation of the creek. The new track bridge had to be designed the same way. However, there was not room for two bridges of that same type to be built side by side. A new through girder bridge was designed with a wider deck and larger beams to support two tracks. The old bridge had to be rolled out and the new one rolled in simultaneously in an eight hour time window. As complex as the bridge component of the project was, all went smoothly and the bridge was successfully installed and in service on April 7, 2000. The third factor in the critical path of construction was the relocation of the state road through the site. Before the old road could be removed, a new one had to be built to take its place. The new road would be at the southern border of the site and would include a highway bridge over the tracks, improved traffic signals, and a landscaped median. It would provide a safer route for cars, trucks, and school buses around the nearby elementary school. Work on the new road and highway bridge began as soon as construction started. Soon after that, grading was being done on 450 acres of the site, and the motoring public was cruising at 50 miles per hour for more than a mile through the Norfolk Southern Construction Project on the existing five-lane state road. The new road design also included a mile of new 16-inch water main and adjustments to a 48-inch sewer line. Just like the existing road, the old water main had to be relocated before the intermodal terminal could be completed. The sewer line was in the way of constructing one of the highway bridge abutments. Both utilities belonged to the county that was opposing the project. Norfolk Southern engineers prepared construction plans for each pipeline and submitted them to the county for review. But the county made no response. It appeared to be another attempt to thwart the project. This time it was Norfolk Southern who filed suit against the county for ignoring their request to relocate the utilities and for not acting on its 1994 transportation plan to relocate the road as a county project. Norfolk Southern reinforced the ground around the sewer line with wooden piles and built the bridge abutment on top of it. They also built the mile of water main without approval or input from the county and stopped short of connecting it to the county's live line. The legal actions between Norfolk Southern and the county were cataloged in the local papers. Construction of the intermodal facility and the road progressed six days a week under close scrutiny of regulatory agencies and the public. In August of 2000, the requirements for construction permits that regulate soil erosion changed in Georgia. At that time, Norfolk Southern was 10 months into a controversial 450-acre grading project. In addition to 24 miles of silt fence, a system of settling ponds, riprap ditches, and numerous inspections, the new regulations required testing water entering and leaving the site to determine that the amount of soil washing into the adjacent waterways as a result of the construction was below the required levels. The announcement of the new rules brought a lot of attention to the project. The legal battle progressed simultaneously with the construction. In a jury trial, Norfolk Southern lost its suit against the county over the utilities and the road, 
Not long after that, on October 30, 2000, in another jury trial, the county lost its suit against Norfolk Southern, claiming that the project was a nuisance. By this time, evidence of the legal battle was showing in the site construction. The new road, with a bridge over the facility tracks and the main line, was complete, but not in service. Traffic was frequently stopped on the old road at the grade crossing, waiting for the train to pass within sight of the deserted new road and overpass. The west end of the old road formed a 12-foot high barrier across the main body of the facility. Pipelines, tracks, craneways, and paving were being constructed on both sides, but could not be tied together. The east end of the road went through the dirt stockpile area, causing a deep valley between two 40-foot hills of earth. New water and sewer pipelines had been constructed, but not connected. Norfolk Southern and the county officials began to discuss what would be required to resolve the conflict. At this point, the bulk excavation was complete. 33,000 truckloads of crushed stone were being hauled in, spread and compacted. A concrete plant was set up on site to facilitate the pouring of 4,800 truckloads of concrete. Nine miles of drainage pipe was being installed. 14 miles of track was under construction and the four new buildings were under roof. All of this was taking place with the five-lane public road still dividing the site. On May 22, 2001, Norfolk Southern reached a settlement agreement with the county. The next day, May 23, 2001, the new road was open and the old one was closed. The barrier that had separated construction was hauled to the dirt stockpile. The water and sewer lines were hooked up and a concentrated effort was made to connect the two halves of the facility that had been constructed. The outstanding legal issues that involved the Corps of Engineers and the state DOT were dropped as a result of the agreement. This is an important key and this is in many ways the culmination of a vision to build the East's most extensive transportation structure to move the nation's goods to and from all points north, south, east and west. On October 30th, 2001, the $100 million facility was officially opened and named the John W. Whitaker Intermodal Terminal after a prominent former railroad official. In Norfolk Southern, we're going to work hard to honor your name by the service we provide at this facility. The Whitaker Terminal is the largest intermodal facility east of the Mississippi River and will be the hub of Norfolk Southern's southeastern intermodal operation. The new facility completes a network that includes Norfolk Southern terminals in Pennsylvania and Chicago, and ports at Charleston and Savannah. Uh, prior to having Austell, Atlanta was way over capacity. We were surviving in Atlanta by using a series of off-site locations to handle the capacity. We now feel that we have the capacity to handle about four million shipments a year. And prior to the completion of Austell and the work we've done at Harrisburg and Chicago, we were able to handle a little over two million. Rubber tire cranes, large enough to straddle a train and truck at the same time, move about the facility. Trucks come and go through a six-lane check-in gate at the entrance. Monitoring stations at five locations measure flow and pH levels of water leaving the facility. The information is transmitted to a computer in the administration building that will automatically close the sluice gates in the ponds if certain pH levels are exceeded. In addition, water samples are taken and analyzed to make sure the adjacent creeks are not harmed from something that might be spilled in the terminal. Measures are in place to ensure that trucks leaving the new facility don't turn in the direction of a nearby residential area. The 5 million cubic yard mountain of dirt is steadily being hauled off site and used in several construction projects in the county, including a school expansion and a road. The city of Austell bought the old Threadmill building next door to the Norfolk Southern Terminal and uses it for some of the city offices and the mayor. Norfolk Southern, instead of going the extra mile, they went the extra hundred miles. They've done great working with the city of Austell. I appreciate that. The operation of the facility will contribute about $50 million annually to the local economy and Norfolk Southern intermodal officials predict that Phase 2 could be needed in about three years after the opening of Phase 1. The completion of the project required the tremendous focus of a network of Norfolk Southern employees with very diverse roles that progressed the work in the face of opposition and ultimately resolved the conflict with the surrounding community. This resulted in a facility that will help Norfolk Southern serve their customers and grow their business. The presence of the Whitaker Intermodal Terminal 
reflects the determination and persistence of the people of Norfolk Southern in pursuit of the vision to be the safest, most customer-focused, and successful transportation company in the world.